Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the string seminar. Uh, today we have Shailesh Lal, who, uh, who will be talking about the world in a grain of sand. So, good. Thanks. Uh, is this audible? Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, so, I'll be talking about work which uh, we which we did with uh, uh, Yang Hui He and uh, Mohammed uh, Zaid Zaz. Uh, Zaid, you might remember from uh, his days as a visiting student at ICTS. Um, and let me like uh, start off by making a disclaimer, uh, well, at least a qualifier, that uh, this work is about uh, machine learning aspects of the string landscape. And as such, uh, uh, it, uh, it represents, it, at least from, from my side, it represents a particular point of view on the problem um, uh, going beyond the calculation itself. Now, the field is young and there are many different ways of thinking about this problem. And indeed, people are thinking about it in different ways. Uh, so, in a sense, it's uh, there'll be things which I'm saying which are uh, more a point of view than a representative uh, uh, of the state of the art. But uh, uh, with the, uh, but I'll try and point that out as clearly as possible. And uh, so, with that caveat, uh, let's uh, let's start. Um, let's start. Okay, why is it this? Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, and one good one good place to start, uh, like um, uh, Julie Andrews taught us in the sound of music, is to start at the beginning. So, uh, well, uh, as uh, beginning as possible, uh, one thing that most people would agree is that, uh, ex like explaining how the world around us comes to comes to be from uh, string theory is at least a significant open problem. Although st string theory has, of course, had many important successes as a theory of quantum gravity, uh, this still remains uh, uh, an open problem uh, as to how exactly the standard model, for example, is embedded in string theory. Uh, and uh, the typical paradigm um, as string theory is again, uh, is defined in 10 dimensions. The typical paradigm is to do something uh, called a compactification where you kind of assume that in the remaining six dimensions are really tiny and rolled up. And uh, uh, that, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, is, is that the physics and the four dimensional approximate physics is essentially controlled by the topology and the geometry of the manifold you're compactifying on. And uh, that's, uh, that's what uh, what will be kind of important for us. And that's why like algebraic geometry will give us such a nice microcosm of the string landscape, um, which we'll come to in a moment, right? And then uh, of course the idea is that, you know, uh, well to find the standard model in string theory, you should, basically try to find what is the compactification that gives rise to the standard model. Great, so uh, one possible strategy, which uh, I've kind of written out as a straw man, is that uh, you could just start like, you know, it's a well-defined problem. You, you start uh, enumerating all the compactification manifolds and fluxes you could have and start solving for what is the corresponding four dimensional physics, like what are the light particles, what are their mass, what are the couplings, masses, whatever. And then you could compare with, you know, the standard model or more likely, you know, some, uh, some completion of the standard model, maybe not the MSSM these days, but yeah. And so, but uh, basically uh, at its heart, you know, no matter whether you're looking for the standard model or your favorite uh, low energy completion, um, the question is this, I mean, why don't you just, like, you know, uh, scan every possibility until you find what you're looking for, right? And then, uh, of course, uh, this thing uh, is, is one of those things which is kind of like, of course, uh, possible in principle, but in practice, it's uh, hindered by many, many problems. Um, uh, one is, of course, the large number of possibilities of what the compactification manifold could be. I think the earliest estimate was 10 to the 500. More modern estimates are 10 to the 200,000, actually. So uh, no one is going to attempt a calculation like this. Uh, the second is uh, uh, the difficulty. And I, I mean that in a, in a technical sense, which I won't be able to explain. Uh, but um, uh, the difficulty of doing even a single computation in this. 
And the third is the actual rarity of the standard model like vacuum. So for example, uh, these people, uh, they actually searched for an MSSM in a particular class of compactifications and they were looking for the MSSM spectrum. And uh, as far as I remember, what they looked at is some 10,000 odd candidates and they found 200, uh, 200 quote unquote right answers. So like one difficulty on its own could be circumventable. You could just work hard enough. Two would be uh, challenging, but three, all three together is basically just, just prohibitive. It's uh, even even uh, this computation, the 10,000 vacua that I talked about, I think it, uh, it ran on the computer and took a few months. And that kind of like seems to be the, uh, uh, the recurring theme in these in computations. It runs on a computer and it takes a few months. Um, and this, in a sense, is basically the landscape problem in string theory. These things put together, or at least like, you know, one very reductive view of the landscape problem. I'm not thinking about, like, you know, some deep principle as to why, uh, you know, things could be the way they are right now uh, around us. I'm just saying that, you know, it's a reductive way of stating it, that, you know, you have so many uh, possible options. Why don't you just look uh, and see which is the right one? And that is actually hindered by many, uh, like, practical difficulties. So uh, here's the idea that you know people have uh, have been kind of working on. It was uh, sparked off by, uh, um, by basically three different uh, groups that were working on the pro well related problems at the same time, um, and uh, the idea was that you know in a sense if you think about it, uh, predict uh, like if you have ten to the five hundred vacua and you're trying to like predict what is going to happen in a particular vacuum. This is like a big data problem. It's uh, in one way, it's not very different from asking, you know, uh, predict, uh, you know, given 10 to the 500 examples, can you predict for me flight times or, you know, uh, what a particular face looks like and things like that. Yeah. So basically the idea is this, that, you know, uh, this, looks like a big data problem. In fact, if you stare at the numbers, it's a big, it's a big data problem on the scale of, uh, you know, it, it goes orders of magnitude beyond even what is looked at in modern machine learning research. Um, so uh, the basic idea is this, that you, basic, uh, that you uh, look at the patterns and heuristics in your data, and then you use those patterns and heuristics to kind of make predictions or inferences and whatnot. Uh, so, and of course, like as the volume of available data in our world uh, is increasing, uh, these kind of methods are playing an increasingly important role. And uh, what is important for us is that, um, especially in terms of uh, methods like neural networks, um, it might be that the overall uh, data that you have is uh, just too large to comprehend at some human scale. And uh, even in that case, uh, when uh, it's and this still remains like a robust framework for working with data. So uh, this is the overall proposal of uh, like this machine learning uh, landscape uh, ideas, uh, or at least one like you know a cartoon point of view that I sketched out for you. That uh, you know your compactification parameters and the corresponding phenomenology are basically data. And then can you learn? Uh, can you use machine learning to learn this data? By which I mean that you know you, at least stated in one way, you take your compactification parameters, and you learn to guess what the output should be, and then uh, hopefully then uh, uh, the best case scenario would be to learn which is the input that should give you the desired output. But in general, you can see that you know uh, the problem is much can be posed much more generally than searching for your favorite compactification or your pet UV completion of the standard model. Uh, it's really a much more general uh, problem of asking, you know, given a particular uh, a compactification, what should the low energy properties of the theory be? And like uh, we talked about, uh, uh, so this is all basically stuff that I uh, said, uh, the volume of data is just huge. And then, you know, you can imagine that, you know, you could use these pattern recognition abilities that machine learning algorithms have. I'll, try and sketch this out for you. And then, you know, you could like, uh, at least uh, uh, you may not be able to do, to uh, like get at quote unquote ground truth or like, you know, the one 
correct answer, but you could um, you could aim to be right on at least some strat on some heuristic statistical scale that you know you may not be right all the time, but maybe you're right you know 70, 80, 90 percent of the time, and that would be that would itself be great. And uh, the idea would be that you know you uh, you take uh, your output phenomenology and you try to uh, associate it to some heuristic patterns that you see, and again. Uh, uh, in the best case scenario, people are right 100% of the time, but that's not necessarily the goal. And uh, what will determine the ground truth? Okay, this is a very, uh, uh, this is, uh, I was just being like uh, super general. Uh, so uh, by ground truth, I meant that, you know, for example, if you take a compactification and you just solve for, uh, you just like, you know, solve for, uh, uh, what the low energy, say, particle masses should be, or some coupling should be from first principles, then that would be your ground truth. It's not a question of the ground truth of what is the world around us. More like, you know, uh, a better way would be that by ground truth, I mean, what is quote unquote the real data that you're trying to approximate? Is that okay? Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, right. Uh, so, uh, so here's the basic goal. Uh, you know, you look at a compactification, and uh, like uh, you try to estimate its likelihood of giving you the standard model. But more, in, more generally, you try to develop some coarse-grained approximation uh, expectations across the string landscape. Like, you know, uh, part of or at least one reason why we have so uh, uh, at least a lot more control over quantum field theory than we did when we started out in the 1920s is that we do have these coarse grained exp uh, expectations i mean you know uh, we uh, if if like you run through some computation and you find that you know your uh, some two loop computation and suddenly your the mass of your electron is 1 kilogram uh, you, anyone would stop and think right and that's uh, not necessarily because and not necessarily because of some uh, deep underlying reason. It's just because you know we kind of quote unquote know at a very instinctive level what these theories should behave like. Uh, right. So the idea is that you know uh, this is there's a completely uh, solved subset of data, at least at you know, the topological level, uh, which is uh, a class of Calabia of three folds and four folds. And uh, so the idea would be that you know try and test these out. Uh, at some level for uh, at, at, some, at some concrete level. Uh, and this is actually being done uh, for uh, 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 a lot of work in this has been done, which kind of like motivates our work because we know that this is a particular setting in which uh, the most idealized version of machine learning works very well. Um, and I'll be coming to what I mean by most idealized in the moment, but uh, you know, at least one order of magnitude estimate you can take away is that usually if you want to train a neural network, you might want about 90% of, or um, at least 80% of, of your available data. But uh, when we are looking at the string landscape, uh, we don't have 80% of the data. Right, so data. <laughs> So this is the basic goal, you know, uh, at, uh, in this heuristic, you have this one giant blob, which is all possible data that you could imagine about the string theory uh, or the string landscape. And in that, some, like somewhere in that, there's a tiny little uh, microcosm, which I have uh, like uh, blown up to unimaginable <laughs> extents. But this is the data that we kind of have at our hands. This is where we know what, uh, what how, um, uh, like a particular compactification behaves. Uh, so this is the data from which we wish to learn. And then uh, usually in practice, uh, you don't, you don't uh, just learn on everything. And then you say, I have, now I'm going to make predictions. You want to check how good your predictions are. So you keep a little bit as a holdout so that you learn on, uh, learn on a little bit or learn on most of your data and then try to predict on the rest to see that you know, um, you, uh, to see how well you're doing. So. Yeah, and that's basically uh, that's basically what uh, I said in, uh, while staring at that uh, uh, cartoon. Uh, it's basically you train the model using your your training data. That's uh, but you also keep aside some proxy for for your uh, for for the data that you don't know, and then you try to estimate your model performance. And now you have a model to deploy and deploy. And you could say that ah, I've solved uh, machine learning. I've solved string theory using machine learning. I'm going to deploy it and you know find the standard model. We'll start here and finish uh, in a couple of years. 
Okay. But there's, there's a problem with that. Uh, the problem is this, that, uh, or oh, at least one problem with that, with uh, let, let me qualify that. There's a problem with naively take, uh, taking that statement too seriously. Uh, there's, an, and there's an assumption here, which is kind of very, very important actually. And it, it's a problem even in real world, like, you know, when people are trying to predict flight times and, you know, transit times and whatnot. Uh, it's that we kind of, when we do this, we are at least assuming that at some coarse grain level, all of these data subsets, you know, your train set, your test set, and your full data set, you know, what you know and don't know, they're all statistically the same. Uh, by which I mean that, you know, if you draw inferences from your training data, and you check them on your test data, then it's perfectly valid to apply them directly to, uh, to, to all data and it'll work. But usually, I mean, we kind of, um, this is a practical problem that occurs even in uh, like, you know, industrial applications or uh, less, uh, uh, less abstract applications that, you know, uh, uh, you train a model and you, when you deploy it, it doesn't really work as well as it should. And over time it starts to work worse and worse and it has to be retrained. And uh, the reason is this, is basically this, that, you know, we are trying to um, draw inferences on a small subset and then extrapolate to everything else. But this is a, like a fraction of your data. And in our case, it's really like a tiny, tiny fraction. Okay. So, I mean, and so just, just doing this might, might or might not work because of uh, like these three reasons. I mean, you know, it might have some special st structures just by accident. Uh, and machine learning may learn those structures and try to predict on basis of that. And then because those structures are not available in more general data, um, it will not work. It may also learn from noise. Like, you know, uh, it might look at some noisy data and think that, ah, you know, there's some deep structure underlying there. And then you kind of like, you know, you guard against this by evaluating on test data because uh, if it's, if it's uh, learning on some idiosyncrasies of your training data, most probably they're not there on your test data. If it's learning on some noise, most probably that noise is not mimicked in the same way on your test data. So you will see it straight away, or at least that's the hope. But the bigger concern is this, that you know, what if your train data is actually not a good representation of the full data in some, you know, uh, some deep underlying way. And I won't show you a deep underlying way, but I'll show you a, a shallow overlying way. <laughs> so, uh, here's, uh, uh, so here's this uh, Calabiao data. Uh, it's basically a set of uh, Calabia manifolds, uh, uh, say C3. Uh, I'll define this in a moment, but the point is that, you know, it's characterized by some, uh, sorry, this should be 7890, some, uh, some 7900 odd uh, topologies, which are associated to two Hodge numbers. And then if you try to, uh, and then if you try to uh, plot out the, the distributions of these Hodge numbers, then you can see that it's very, very skewed. And in general, like, you know, when, whenever we, uh, uh, at least I'm told by Yang, that whenever we look at distributions uh, uh, of data more generally, we find this same skewed problem here. Uh, 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 right. So, uh, so uh, if uh, now imagine that, you know, this is your proxy for the string landscape. So your, uh, the manifold and the data that determines um, uh, a CC manifold, I'll, I'll show you in a moment what it is. Uh, that is the analog of your compactification data. And the output Hodge number is the analog of your phenomenology, what you wish, what you wish to learn, right? Now you might consider the following thought experiment. Like I told you that uh, CC is your proxy for your string landscape. So now, and this is a, a setting where we actually know the full data set. So we can actually test out our ideas. So you could say that, okay, like uh, let's randomly sample some 10% of the data and then uh, see how good is this proxy. So uh, one very zeroth order question is that, you know, do all the H11 values appear in, uh, in the random sample that you've taken? And indeed, if you uh, look at this graph and you say that, okay, I'll take a small enough random sample, which is again, all that we have, uh, then, uh, you know, some H11 values won't even appear. So this is uh, an actual random sample that I took. And if I, and the point is that, you know, if I learn from this random sample, I won't even know that certain Hodge numbers exist. Right. So uh, if I, if I learn from this data, then how well will I do when I'm extrapolating to, uh, to the rest of the CC manifolds? That's, that's the question. Right. So, uh, so again, like, you know, this is, uh, these are the concerns that we have. What if there isn't enough data? What if the data isn't representative of the available data doesn't represent the overall landscape? 
And again, I mean, since we have solved only a tiny fraction of the string landscape, so we might, uh, as a conservative, uh, um, as a conservative estimate, we might say that okay, probably it is true that we don't have representative data at hand, and there will be, as you know, uh, you know, when you when you systematically start computing across the landscape, there will be things that surprise us. Uh, so what what might you do at this point? One option could be that wait until you have eighty percent of your data. The other option could be. Um, to learn from minimal data, uh, extrapolate to unseen data, uh, and most importantly, have graceful failure modes. Because uh, if, if we are working in this regime, uh, then we might, we should expect to fail. But so, and in that, uh, in that case, all we can do is expect, uh, is try to fail as, as, as gracefully as possible. So uh, on that inspiring note, let's uh, turn to the rest of the talk. So I'll tell you about machine learning, uh, an idea of similarity. And the idea is, again, that, you know, try to, instead of trying to predict what a vacuum is, I mean, what, what, no, what it contains, you try to predict how similar is the vacuum to a uh, previous vacuum that you know of. And this is, in a sense, uh, a slightly different question, which goes a long way towards solving this. And I'll show you this in the context of cat and dog pictures. Uh, and uh, then I'll tell you about how uh, these these ideas actually concretized in machine learning and then you know uh, we'll close with the uh, kalabi example great so uh, this this example is um, I, I believe it's from fefe lee uh, and she gave this example and she's one of the people who's done a lot of uh, the pioneering work on on these kinds of ideas and the idea is that you know draw you you kind of draw inspiration an analogy from uh, how humans learn. So imagine that you know you're teaching a toddler uh, how to uh, train, uh, how to recognize different animals. Uh, you uh, you don't typically need to know what is. Uh, you don't need to show a toddler like uh, ten thousand images. Uh, I'm definitely not smarter than the average toddler. I didn't need ten thousand images, so you don't need this. Uh, so the point is, uh, so usually one or two images are actually enough. And uh, the idea is behind doing this is that you know your uh, when, whenever uh, the child sees new new images, then it tries to uh, associate these images to things that you know it's kind of like most similar to what it has seen before. And then uh, so it might seem like a regular classification problem that ah you know I've seen 10, 10 examples of uh, cats and ten examples of dogs, and now I'll just classify into cats and dogs. But there's a small but subtle difference which is important for us. Yeah, so again, now you have cats and dogs and you have these tiny sets of examples and what I'm, uh, at least the example that Lee has, uh, what, the, uh, what the child is learning is not really like, you know, that this is a dog and this is a dog, but in a sense, what it is learning is an abstraction of that concept, which is that these two images are the same in some way and these two images are the same in another way. So, right. And this, this kind of framework has, actually has many benefits which are very, uh, which can be very useful for us when we do landscape exploration. So firstly, uh, it's a robust framework, like what I said, that it should be robust even in the frame of limited data. So for example, if this is a bird, then um, uh, so is this. And you know, we have this on, on record from people uh, who first went and explored like, you know, uh, uh, say New Zealand or, what not from Europe, and uh, you know they found these weird birds and animals and all. But when people looked at a dodo or an ostrich, they didn't say, "I have no idea what this is." They said that I have never seen a bird like this. So at some instinctive level, they knew that they were looking at a bird. And again, they hadn't seen millions of sparrows. And here's the graceful failure mode, which is again I think something very important for us. So supposing you show a child badgers. Now, if all, the, if all that people have learned is how to say whether it's a cat or not a cat, or say whether it's a cat or dog or an elephant, then it will probably say, look at this image and say that, ah, you know, this is 51% like a dog, which again is not very useful for us. This is the analog of like randomly sampling in that Calabria data set, uh, sorry. And having learned from a data set, which has zero examples of H11 equal to one, and then saying that, ah, you know, it's 51% like H11 equal to two. What can be more useful 
is that if you're learning for similarity, then what you're more likely to conclude, and again, these are like heuristic expectations, what you're more likely to conclude is that these guys, they are not very similar to cats and dogs, but they're at least similar to each other. So at least on some statistical scale, you might say that, ah, you know, I found something new, which one might want to look at. Right. So uh, this is this is what I mean by graceful failure mode. That uh, in in machine learning, this is called zero shot learning. That you know, an, uh, a neural network or your, whatever your machine learning framework uh, you're using learns to recognize objects from classes that it has never seen before while it was being trained. So th this is, I think, like you know, something which uh, we should expect. I, and this is why, uh, you know, this was one of the main motivations for our work that how do you work sorry, in, in limited uh, data and how do you work, especially knowing that, you know, uh, when you try to exp extrapolate these ideas to the full landscape, you will likely fail. So, right. So here's the idea. I mean, uh, at least one idea of why, you know, your, uh, your data is much, uh, is, is, is why you know recasting classification as a similarity is a helpful idea. I gave you like the cat and dog pictures, but you know there's at least you know some order of magnitude estimate you can do about the amount of data that you have. So, for example, if you're looking for classification, uh, you might say that okay, I have n elements of my data and I wish to organize them into k classes. But the similarity problem is a little different. So uh, instead of uh, like, you know, organizing say X1 into C1 and X1 into C2, uh, what you're trying to say is that X1 is the same as X2 if C1 is equal to C2 and if and only if, right? So what this does is that, you know, rather than having this data of N elements being organized into K classes, you have a data set made of pairs of your original data. And now you only have two classes. So either they're similar or not. So you can see that, you know, the amount of data that you have, this, this is a slightly misleading counting, uh, but okay, uh, you, at least you might imagine that you have some n choose two elements. And uh, so the amount of available data is going up and the number of classes going down. So uh, this is one reason why, you know, these, uh, these frameworks are much less data hungry than, uh, than uh, usual machine learning. And also another reason why they are kind of able to, uh, to, um, and to uh, learn from one or two examples, because at least if you have enough examples from some other class, and the reason why uh, the thinly populated class elements are similar to each other is the same as the reason why those uh, numerous elements are similar to each other, you can transfer that learning. Great. So uh, here's a summary of uh, all that I said before. Um, uh, basically, uh, this machine learning similarity, it kind of promises that, you know, you should be able to learn from very minimal data and uh, you should be able to extrapolate reliably even to unusual examples like ostriches from sparrows and even to like, you know, uh, examples that you've never seen before du during training like badgers. So, uh, and because we expect that, you know, uh, when we're doing like these landscape explorations using machine learning, uh, the data that we've learned is much less than your available, uh, your, the possible data that you have, uh, there will be unusual examples and weird things that you've never seen before. So and that's the basic idea that, you know, uh, that's why this framework, which is uh, somewhat different from uh, usual uh, machine learning problems of classification or regression, can be a very powerful uh, probe into the landscape. And uh, one of the most practical ways that we know which uh, works very well uh, is Siamese neural networks, which was developed by a bunch of people, including these. And uh, yeah. So that's what uh, I'll talk about now. So Siamese neural networks are basically, uh, like I said, they are a framework to quantify similarity. Uh, Sorry, what happened? Okay, so they're a framework to uh, quantify similarity, right? So uh, basically, what is happening is that you know you have some abstract data D, uh, which could be the set of your string uh, vacuo or your, the set of your cat, dog, and badger pictures, and now uh, you're trying to learn a map. Uh, you're trying to learn a representation of the data into some auxiliary embedding space, right? And uh, but you're not trying to learn any old map. Uh, you're trying to learn a map which has a specific property. And the idea is that, you know, uh, the points that are similar to each other, so XA and XP in this picture, so it's, so this is called an anchor, which is kind of your reference image. 
positive because it's uh, p for positive because it's uh, like similar and n for negative because it's dissimilar. So your anchor and your positive, which are similar to each other, they should be mapped close together. And points that are dissimilar should be mapped far apart. This is, this is the basic idea. Great. And where does it uh, where does it uh, have its origins? So again, like you know, the reason why I'm saying this is because uh, so these are not like abstract ideas, just abstract ideas. They actually have some very practical applications. So that's what kind of motivates us into uh, uh, seeing whether we can use it for our ends as well. So uh, and you can kind of like you know, uh, this is like in some ways a beautifully illustrative example on its own. So the idea is that you know they were trying to solve a very specific problem, which is that you know uh, you uh, you go in, you uh, hand in a check at a bank in the days when you used to, and then uh, the bank will kind of verify whether the signature matches with whatever they have on their records. The problem is that you know there are like hundreds of thousands of classes, or every customer can be thought of as one class, and you know your uh, your check has to be assigned to that class correctly. And uh, of course, I mean, so this is, uh, this is the problem that you have, like, in a sense, your data set is very shallow. Uh, you have many, many classes, maybe hundreds, thousands, and there are only one or two examples for each class. And what is worse than that, I mean, even this you could try and live with, is that new classes are always being added. So every time you train a, uh, train a neural network that can, you know, uh, sol uh, that can classify into a thousand, uh, into a hundred thousand classes, by the time some, uh, maybe 10,000 people hopefully have already joined. So now your classifier is worse than useless because those will be like all those new people that will try to classify into uh, the previous uh, guys, right? But instead, you know, what you could do is to try, like, you know, train this Siamese network. And rather than, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, classifying this data, it's trying to like compare whether the signature that you have on record is the same as the one that you have on the check. And then if the two signatures are similar, then you just process the check. So in this, in, in this, so this is like a very like illustrate, I, I always find this a very really illustrative uh, um, like example of the kind of problems that I talked about earlier uh, and uh, which are kind of uh, expectedly relevant for the string landscape. Right. So I told you about uh, Siamese neural networks. Uh, so I just want to tell you like a couple of slides about neural networks. Uh, so it's basically, as you might imagine, uh, uh, a neural network is a, is a network of neurons. So you have a bunch of neurons and they're arranged in some layers and you give it an input and you pr pr process an output. And now uh, basically uh, training the network is basically uh, training the parameters of the of, of your uh, of your neural network so that given a particular input you get the desired output. So uh, right. So the point of all of this is that uh, you know uh, uh, this neural network is basically every neuron is basically a combination of a linear uh, is is. Uh, is a two-step uh, process. It's a combination of a linear uh, linear combination of data, and then a nonlinearity, which is also non-polynomial, is applied to it. Uh, and this is actually, you know, now uh, at least I didn't give you any theorems or anything like that. But you could imagine that you know such a stacked combination of extremely nonlinear functions, all of which are learning from each other, can be a very powerful, very expressive uh, function. You know, almost anything that you might want to express. Uh, going from the similarity of two cats to the similarity of two string vacua can be possibly encoded in this. So it's very, very adaptable, very expressive, but correspondingly also very data hungry. And this, and it is that data, it is also, you know, that hunger for data that we wish to mitigate. Uh, right. So uh, again, so let me, uh, so I just want to tell you a little bit about how these networks uh, end up learning this kind of an embedding and it will only take, it's a short excursus, but it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's a useful uh, picture of like, you know, how these computations actually set up and done, um, right. So uh, neural networks, they learn from data by optimizing a cost function. And the simplest example is this linear regression that we, we've all, always studied, uh, like from, I think, uh, high school onwards, that you know, you, you're given some data and you're trying to predict some uh, trend in that data. And then you say that, okay, I'm going to model it by some generic polynomial. 
And then uh, I'm going to tune my parameters um, so that this cost function, which is the difference between your observation and your prediction is minimized. So, and uh, again, I mean, this is kind of a little repetitive, but it's useful when we think about Siamese networks, um, because I want to give you a sense of how they function. Uh, so to get intuition about uh, the effect of a particular loss function, uh, the best thing to do, at least what I find the best thing to do is to imagine what would happen if the loss function were actually at its optimum. So this function would uh, be at its optimum if it was zero, and that would happen when all the uh, all your predictions were the same as your observations. So what this function actually tries to do is to try to encourage the neural network or whatever machine learning you're doing uh, to uh, reproduce all the data exactly. The cost function for Siamese networks is somewhat different because remember, we're not processing one data at a time, yet we're processing two data and trying to see whether they're similar or not. So instead of processing one data or one datum, it's trying to, to process pairs. So it's given pairs, X1 and X2, and it's supposed to output one if they're similar and output zero if they're not similar. And then the, uh, and then the loss function is basically this, this loss, this contrastive loss. Uh, it's called the contrastive loss. But the point is this, that you know it's, uh, it's expressed as it should be in terms of the distance between those two points. Uh, in embedding space, right? This is the distance in embedding space. This is the usual dot product. So let's imagine uh, what is this loss function doing? And again, uh, the same way as for the mean square loss, the, only, uh, the best way to answer it is to imagine that the loss function is actually zero, right? So when is the zero? So it's zero when, uh, when if y is equal to zero, then this distance is greater than one. And y is equal to one, then this distance is zero. So when y is one, then the only term that contributes is this. So this should be zero. When y is zero, the only term that contributes is this, which means that this should be greater than one. So that this is a negative number and the maximum of zero with the negative number is again zero. Yes. So, uh, so this is exactly the kind of property we were looking for, right? Uh, your, your, your mapping must be so that if two points are similar, then, and then this map, which the neural network is trying to learn is going to map them close together. It may not, uh, again, map them exactly on top of each other, but at least in some, like I said, you're trying to not to be right all the time, uh, but to be right in some coarse grained sense. And if they're not similar, then uh, it will map them far apart. So of course, now what, what this does is that your data set, which was, maybe some point cloud now has broken up into disjoint clusters and every cluster is made up of data that are similar to each other. And of course, in this, you have to kind of specify what your criterion for similarity is. But most importantly, now the idea is, is very simple. Uh, uh, now, when you're given new data, then you just act on that data with your map that you learned, and then you see which cluster it is mapped to. And then from that, you try to infer what its properties are. Correspondingly, what could happen, as in the Badger example, is that there are enough data which are not being mapped to any cluster that you know from before, but they're they hopefully being mapped to a new cluster. And then you can, right in front of your eyes, you can see a new class of string vac you're forming. So, uh, right, and I said again, so this is the basic idea that, you know, uh, in algebraic geometry, there are these uh, Calabi-Yau manifolds, and uh, they are again very. Uh, these, this kind of topological data is very relevant to uh, to string uh, to string phenomenology, and the idea is to just uh, take all of those, uh, you know, badgers, banks, all of those things, all of those ideas, and just apply it here. And again, this is uh, like a natural testing ground because here we know everything, and at least some reduced data set, we know everything. And then what should happen is that, you know, manifolds of quote unquote similar topology are mapped closer together. And I'll try to, and I will quantify this in a moment. It sounds, and it is very vague. So uh, let me show you two or three slides, which are the outer extent of my knowledge of algebraic geometry. But uh, yeah, it's kind of useful to see this, to know, like, you know, if you have 
a string vacuum or if you have a Calabio manifold, you have to give it as data to your neural network. So what is the data that you're giving? So I will try to describe that for you now. So in algebraic geometry, the idea is this, that if you're thinking of a manifold, you don't think of it in terms of say coordinate patches or curvature tensors or whatnot. You think of it in terms of zero loci of algebraic equations or polynomial equations in some auxiliary space. So for example, this round two sphere is this locus. And uh, as it should be, I mean, there's one real constraint and it's embedded in three dimensions. So you have a 2D manifold. The other important thing for us, because we're trying to learn in this uh, exercise, we're trying to learn to predict the topology is that the degree of the, the polynomial completely encodes the topology. And again, I mean, I think the best way to see this is by example. So here's a sphere and here's an ellipsoid. And with some uh, things, uh, you can see that, you know, the coefficients of the polynomials are different, but topologically, they are the same object. So the upshot is this, we are going to try to represent uh, manifolds as polynomials in some embedding space, but we don't need to know the full polynomial, just the degree of the polynomial is enough. So here's an example of that. So those were real manifolds embedded in real space, complex manifold embedded in complex space. So, uh, and because it's a compact manifold, we will embed in projector space. So that you know, we just don't go everywhere, right? So this is kind of like, uh, what I'm assured is the simplest example. Uh, so you have P4 and uh, you have this locus of these, uh, uh, this zero locus of this polynomial. So you have a four dimensional projective space and you have a degree five polynomial. And this is actually, uh, uh, this is a uh, Calabia threefold called the Fermat quintic. And you can write this as, uh, you know, uh, as a single integer five, which is, or you can also write this as four comma five or four slash five. So instead, like you can do more complicated things. And so for example, you could go to five dimensions and again, you're trying to embed, um, you're trying to embed uh, uh, a three, uh, three complex dimension space, uh, a manifold in that. So if you go to five dimensions, you could imagine that you have an intersection of two degree three polynomials or an intersection of degree four and degree two polynomials. And again, that should give you a, three, a 3D complex manifold. So, and these are again, all Calabria manifolds or all Calabria topologies, right? But how is this Calabria? Um, so, because you're looking at, uh, again, I'm, and I'm just quoting the results for you, uh, because you're looking at uh, zero loci of polynomials in PN, the manifold is already Kähler. The Calabria condition is expressed in this difference that, uh, this is basically the condition that the first churn class vanishes if you go through everything. And it's a threefold because of this difference. So three is four minus one. Yeah. So you basically count the number of polynomials. That's the number of constraints, and then the dimension of your uh, embedding space. And that the difference between that is uh, the dimension of your Calabria, and that's why it's a quote unquote complete intersection. So in general, uh, so this is how we give data to the neural network. Uh, in general, uh, it's not enough, or it's not, at least it's not the best choice always to consider just a single pro projector space, but you think of a product of projector spaces. And then you consider again, like not one polynomial, but as we've already done, say some, N, uh, some K number of polynomials. And then you look at uh, the degrees of your polynomial PK in some along some projector space coordinates. And that basically gives you uh, your configuration matrix. And the idea is that, you know, using this configuration matrix, can you read off the Hodge numbers? And in general, this is a very difficult problem. And, uh, but this has actually been solved completely from first principle computations. So this will be our data for ML. And, you, and this is where we'll try to like, you know, test out all of those ideas. Train, basically what we'll do is, train a Siamese network on very, very small fractions of data and then see how well we do. And that will kind of be the, the test of these ideas. Right. And again, the, uh, the, the problem, the machine learning problem is this, that you have two Calabria topologies, Q1 and Q2, and they're similar. And I declare that they're similar if their H11s one are the same. And this is again, the same criteria of similarity that we had to begin with. 
And uh, again, we are training the Siamese network to learn this similarity. And uh, how do we give information to the network? So again, this is just for completeness. Uh, usually neural networks, they analyze uh, images by treating them as matrices. And then those matrices uh, you can act on by linear operations and then uh, apply non-linearities. Uh, we'll turn this around and then we'll say that, okay, you know, whatever works for, a, for, a, for an image, let's just try to get it to work for uh, just a general matrix or a color wave, a Q matrix for us. And this was kind of, I think, the first people who did this were Yang and with Andre Lucas and then um, Harold Urban and Finotello, they have the current state of the art uh, results for this. So, and I said uh, that this data set is again, highly disbalanced. And uh, so again, so H11 equal to 16, you can't even see on this, it actually appears only once, whereas H11 equal to seven appears some 1500 times. And one of the things to do is again, to account for this disbalance. And so it turns out that, you know, the, the simplest thing that you could imagine that, you know, you could say that, ah, I should, the framework that I've set up should work on very little data. So let me just take very little data by construction. So rather than, you know, one, one way to cure this could have been that, okay, I'm going to invent some synthetic data that kind of mimics properties of these sparsely populated classes, but rather than do that, and that has been done in the literature, uh, but rather than do that, uh, we can kind of like turn it around and say that, okay, rather than trying to increase these probabilities, let me try to decrease uh, my training data for, for this. For, for even for the uh, like densely populated classes. And then, uh, so, uh, so, and the other great thing is that, you know, from that hunger for data, which was like, you know, I need maybe like, uh, and maybe I need like, you know, 90% or like 85% to do well, and, and we have driven it down to 1%. So that's another thing that we actually need. Like we don't have that much available data. So, right. So. So this is what the Siamese network learns. So, right. And uh, so uh, this is a picture of uh, all the Calabria three folds, the, uh, the complete intersection, the CC three folds uh, embedded in that uh, represent in, in a three dimensional representation space. And the colors are basically encoding what the H1 values are. And you can kind of see that, you know, similar colors are clumped together. So this three-dimensional space is uh, what we were trying to learn. Uh, this is a bit, uh, sorry, just a moment. So when we started out, started out, out, sorry, just a moment. Yeah, so when we started out, we, we said that, you know, okay, what happened? Yeah, yeah. So we were going to map it to that uh, RD space, and so three was just chosen by uh, this work best, like because it was three dimensional. We could uh, just visualize it in front of our eyes, and it seemed to work. Uh, I, I mean, uh, usually people choose higher dimensional spaces to map it to, but here three worked, and we didn't have to do like you know other funky things to then visualize excessively high dimensional data. Yeah, so uh, this is this is basically you know the realization of that cartoon that we had that you know we had some abstract color space of Calabria matrices and all of them are represented here clustered by the H11 values. Great. So as an application, so this is an application of the of this idea you, uh, like you know we had this overall framework that you know uh, we're going to see if we can predict topologies by asking which is the topology that we know that it is the most similar to so and h11 was kind of like a proxy for uh, for phenomenology uh, so right so we have this representation so that manifolds of the same h11 are likely very close together 
but you can kind of like flip it around and you say that, okay, if the network is working properly and we have reason to believe it is, uh, manifolds that are kind of like mapped close together should have the same H1. And then we can use that to predict for new manifolds what the H11 should be. So this is the basic idea. Uh, you uh, decide your topo the topology of some unknown guy by looking at its neighbors. So you start with the manifolds whose uh, H11s you know, and you map them to your R3. Um, then you map every, uh, you map the new uh, manifold whose topology you wish to learn uh, or you wish to guess by mapping it through the same network into R3. And then you look at its nearest neighbors. So in general, uh, like, you know, uh, this, you look at some K number of nearest neighbors, this number you have to kind of tune by seeing what works best. Um, and then you look at the Hodge numbers of the nearest neighbors. So I've kind of like reddened it out because uh, this is actually the name of the algorithm. It's K nearest neighbors classification. And then you, and then it's just simple voting. You just vote amongst that. Uh, so, and in this, like I've kind of simplified the problem. I didn't try to go for learning spontaneous clusters. That is kind of work in progress. We have every reason to believe that it should work. Initial explorations suggest that it is working, but I'm trying to find a good way of representing those calculations, right? So, and then you pick the most common H11, and then you say that, okay, that's, that must be the H11 of this guy that we don't know. And in this way, we can predict the topology of the whole test data. So what does it look like? So as a wise man once said, uh, no talk on Calabria is complete without uh, a table of very large numbers. So here's, uh, here are some moderately large numbers. So uh, we trained the, the data on, uh, you can see not very many manifolds. So maybe three to some 30, 35, not more than that. And everything else was in, in, in an unknown data set. And uh, for, for most cases, the predictions that it made were very uh, were kind of like most of them were actually true. So like, you know, in this case, it made uh, 1,235 predictions out of which 1,226 were correct. And actually all 1,226 were, uh, and those were the only 1,226 uh, uh, with H11 equal to six. So, yeah. So in this case, it seems to be working uh, for the three folds, it seems to be working very well by training on even 1% of the data. If you plug through numbers, you'll find that, you know, this, all of these things translates to about 98% accuracy. You can also do the same thing for four folds. So complete intersection Calabria of four folds. So instead of having 7,000 or 8,000 manifolds there, you have about a million. And the demographics are again very similar, like the H1, the Hodge number distributions, again, those bell curves looking like things. And this time we trained on about half percent of the data. I think that was about 5,000 odd manifolds. And then, uh, so uh, in this case, we reached about 45% accuracy, which doesn't look as impressive as 98% because it isn't, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it does very well, you know, in terms of exclusions. Like, you know, if you were to pose the problem as, can you exclude parts of the Calabria data set, which are definitely not uh, H11, say, for example, H11 equal to three. Now from a million Calabria uh, uh, data, it excluded all but 1000 of them. And actually like, you know, it turned out, it turned out that 680 of them were actually correct. So from the point of view of like, you know, in terms like, although even 45, percent accuracy doesn't uh, look good as good as 98 and again because it isn't and this is kind of in progress as to how to improve this but uh, you can see that you know for an initial idea of uh, this landscape exploration where you say that uh, can you predict for me which are definite uh, which manifolds definitely do not have a particular phenomenology so already we can see that it's kind of beginning to work very well even in even when the data set is truly large and we are on like deliberately trying to learn from small fractions of it. So uh, now we are done. So uh, here are the things we talked about. Uh, I said that uh, machine learning, it can basically be a very powerful tool to, uh, to kind of get insights about the string landscape, uh, given the fact that we expect to have a huge amount of data, certainly going beyond human comprehension. 
and but at the same time like you know uh, there are some uh, issues which is which are basically uh, due to the fact that you know we only have a tiny fraction of data to learn from so there are some uh, difficulties in that as as in how do you control machine learning frameworks from learning nonsense uh, but there are also like you know deeper concerns as to like you know what uh, like the things that you've learned on a small subset how applicable is it to a lot a much much larger data set and in this case like you know kalabia of data sets they kind of like you know illustrate this complexity uh, in a very simple setting it's almost like you know a kinematic version of landscape exploration because you're looking just for like you know some uh, very reduced information about spectra in a much simpler setting uh, but also in a setting in which the final answer is known so we can actually test these ideas of like you know doing what is called few shot or one shot or zero shot learning which is uh, to train these neural networks on a deliberately small fraction of data and then try to see you know how well are you extrapolating uh, across the entire landscape so in this sense you know uh, this was in a sense a prototype technique for searching for the standard model in the landscape but also if you uh, look at these uh, these graphs uh, it's not really uh, it's not really limited to you know classifying whether you know uh, Calabria manifold has a particular Hodge number or not. It's not a really a binary classification. It's really like you know clumping uh, different parts of Calabria data close to each other depending on some criteria that we've given it. So in that sense, you know it's. Uh, probably and hopefully, uh, at least hopefully, um, very tuned to answering uh, 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 what I think is a much richer question than, you know, uh, an obsessive hunt for one particular compactification, uh, which is to answer like, you know, uh, what, uh, uh, which we kind of like pointed out as to what is a coarse gained expectation of phenomenal string vacuum phenomenology like you know if you give it a, if you take a particular vacuum what can you expect from it now in in terms of uh, there are of course like you know some some human uh, intuitions that we have so for example if you're looking for uh, say um, uh, and i'm not an expert but if you're looking for a uh, vacuum to do certain things in cosmology or phenomenology there are obviously things with that you will not do which you know will not work anyway but can we like you know try and lift that to like a very systematic thing. And hopefully there it might be that, you know, still new properties emerge and surprise us, uh, but that is just shameless speculation. So uh, that's all that I have to say. So thank you for your time. Uh, thanks Shailish for the talk. Uh, are there any more questions? Yeah, I have one question. Uh, which is that, I mean, has it so far been applied to learn something new? Um, not, not this in particular, like this is not this idea in particular, uh, or, or, or this uh, scheme of doing things. There are, uh, there's a different framework called reinforcement learning, in which people have used to construct a genuinely new vacua for, for string, uh, 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 for deep brain configurations. So uh, that is one place where, uh, but yeah, that, that I didn't uh, talk about here. But this, I think right now, uh, it hasn't, as far as I know, no, no been used to apply uh, to learn something new. I believe there was some work, uh, but again, this is like going far beyond what I know about uh, like developing some conjectures for Calabio manifolds using machine learning and they did develop them. But uh, again, that's like far beyond my uh, knowledge. So these use some more general class of Calabria for which not everything is known. Is that the point? Uh, so I, I don't know about that 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 particular work uh, about proving uh, uh, like uh, about uh, proving those conjectures. Uh, so e even in this case, uh, it it uh, it means uh, there is a much larger data set uh, of Calabria threefolds where you kind of remove the complete intersection condition. And that data set is about 10 to the nine in size. So it, it's really much, much bigger than any of these. In fact, it's much bigger than uh, most modern uh, machine learning data sets. So uh, yeah, so I think uh, that is the, probably the next logical place to, to, uh, to uh, apply these ideas. 
But again, that would be a setting where you already know the answer and you're trying to see how well you can do. So in the, the cases where you said there are some new results, right? I mean, there you work with the data set for which not everything is known. Is that the point? Uh, the cases uh, for which there are new results, uh, you mean the reinforcement learning, the new value? Yeah. yeah. No, so that I, I believe what they're trying to do is uh, uh, basically take the dbrain configuration and then try to guess what it's uh, or, or learn using some uh, some different, really different techniques of machine learning, learn what the vacuum solution should look like. So that is something totally different, I think. But then I think uh, uh, there probably once you have the result, then you can go back and check whether you've done it correctly or not. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, even in this, uh, where this uh, complete intersection Calabria house that you studied, uh, are uh, other data like uh, the triple intersection numbers? Yes. Uh, yeah. Are they within reach? And can one? Yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. they I are think. all. Firstly, are they computed? Uh, yes. So uh, for the CC threes, at least, I think the triple intersection uh, numbers are known. Uh, I think it should be possible. Uh, I'm trying it. Uh, there are aspects of it which are a little bit more difficult because usually the triple intersection numbers, you even have to predict how many there are right, for a manifold. So even, even that, uh, I, I, as far as I know, there is no regular uh, rule. There are some, I mean, there are some- You mean how many non-zero ones? Uh, because it's uh, the CIJK, the IJK are indexed by, oh, the, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. by the H11. Right. So. Once you know the H11, you know uh, there would be uh, at most uh, right, so right. many H11. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. a so, symmetric. Uh, uh, yeah. But I, yeah, I think it's definitely within reach. Yes. There are other topological quantities, I guess, like churn classes and all, but they are just, you can read them off from the configuration matrix. Uh, you just have to take some particular sums. So, but in that case, I guess you have to train for each H11 separately or no? Uh, or you first take all the H11 for some fixed value of H11. So, for yeah. the, there are the same number of so, triple intersection numbers. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, we probably have to see uh, what is the best way of doing it because. We also have to balance it off uh, against the constraint of having or not having enough data. Um, there is, I mean, uh, like on purpose, I didn't really talk about, say, for example, H21, where the same, same, uh, same uh, methods work um, uh, much worse, actually. They go up to about like around 30, 40% accuracy, but not more. Uh, but even in that case, uh, like uh, I, I just mentioned it because of what you pointed out, uh, even that in, in that case, I think it was uh, Urban and Finitello, they kind of did a more systematic analysis of the data set and they found that if you know the H11, it's much easier to predict the H21s. So it could well be possible that, you know, even if you don't fix the H11 to begin with and say that I will work in the reduced set, uh, you take the manifold and uh, like instead of predicting, uh, say, just the triple intersection number by itself, you, uh, by, from the configuration matrix itself, you also give it uh, the H11 to help it learn. It could be possible that you need to do that, but I'm not, uh, without, yeah, I mean, without doing the actual computation, it's very hard to say what will work and what won't. In the point is, if you don't give H11, then even the number of uh, outputs is not clear, right? I mean, it's- Yeah, exactly, it's... that's what I was asking. Yes, yeah. so, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, but there are also, um, uh, there, are, there, there could be like, you know, ways to kind of like get around that problem of, you could, uh, again, and you could try to say that, okay, let me first predict the number of outputs. Let me then try to like, you know, uh, then there are like, you know, very, very machine learning techniques like, if you have uh, matrices of a different size. So for example, this is another thing I didn't talk about. Uh, the Calabria configuration matrices are all of different size. So how do you pr process that into a uniformly sized input for uh, uh, for the neural network? So there are some methods and all for doing that. I mean, uh, so uh, uh, one could try to do that kind of like in reverse, like predict a, a uniformly sized output and then say that, 
uh, can I also pred uh, predict what the size of the output should have been and then downscale back to that? I mean, but again, it's it's uh, just just guesswork. What is probably more likely is what you pointed out that uh, in some way, shape, either fix H11 and then predict the um, uh, triple intersection numbers, or you try to um, uh, give give the H11 as an additional input. Yeah. Yeah, in that case, there is also this. Uh, you have to probably pick some good basis in the H11 uh, because uh, how you label the different uh, uh, two cycles will be important. And I mean, CIJK works makes sense in a particular basis. So, uh, so whether there is uh, some basis might be right. better or easier. Yeah, or... that that might play a role. In fact, that that was one of the reasons for like you know doing. Uh, like, so, uh, like, again, something that I didn't talk about was uh, 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 how these, uh, like, you know, we, we just said that, uh, just take a manifold, embed it in, in some product of VNs. But in general, of course, there are many ways of embedding, right? And uh, some, some ways are just better than others. So e even that kind of like plays a role in, uh, even in the practical computations, uh, like um, well, uh, the ab initio computations, let me say, and even in how well you do machine learning, like you know how uh, how you have chosen to embed. So yeah, there are like in that case, it's not quite a basis choice, but it's intuitively like, um, well, it at least informs how you set up the data set. So yeah, it's it's uh, likely that you know things like that also play a role. So in order to take into account this skewness of uh, of the plots or, uh, of the H11. So oh yeah, so uh, that was basically like, you know, uh, uh, by saying that uh, since the framework doesn't need a lot of data to work with, then uh, you just pick some minimal no number of uh, yeah, examples from each set. Artificial set. Uh, for yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I did it artificially because I wanted to um, uh, sidestep the problem of like, predicting what are new clusters. If, for example, if I uh, did a random sampling and I would have some H11 ones that were clearly missing, ideally what should happen is that those uh, H11 manifolds should clump up and, in the representation space and then you can read it off from there that there's a new class that you didn't have in your train set. Uh, characterizing that is uh, another layer of complexity which I didn't want to add because we have already uh, like you know at, like there are many uh, levels of complexity in in this kind of a thing. So we were trying to illustrate one point that how do you remove uh, data uh, uh, the the hunger for data and uh, but it is definitely uh, so we've done some initial kind of explorations. It kind of suggests that that should also work that even if you randomly sample and you end up with some missing values of Hodge numbers, it should uh, cluster properly and you should be able to read but In the this. tables which you showed that true, uh, true value and the predicted value are still a bit different. Right? Oh, so it's not, so it's not a difference between true and predicted value. It's more like, it's, it's like how many manifolds have that particular value. So where it's saying that, you know, some 1250 manifolds have a particular value, it turns out that, you know, 1240 have an out of my original 1250, some say 1239 was actually correct. Yeah, for the, but for the, yeah, for the. Uh -huh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, populated ones that yeah, good. Uh, so usually when, when people uh, do, uh, uh, so uh, again, I mean, you could have asked like, you know, what's the meaning of, uh, even, even at a machine learning level, like what's the meaning of including one data point, right? I mean, it makes no sense. And indeed, like, you know, what people do sometimes is to remove these data points altogether, these classes altogether, and say that they're just so weird that, you know, we, we, we can't learn it using machine learning. But one of these aspects, one of the things about learning similarity is also like, not just learning when things are similar, it's also like, you know, learning when things are different. So we should also be able to say that, you know, the rest of the data is significantly different from H11 equal to 16. And that's what it shows that you know you you have one possibility for h11 equal to 16 and indeed the it shows that you know most of the uh, most of those manifolds are detected as not having h11 equal to 16 and it gets confused for about 40 of them i see yeah I see. thanks i think there is a question in the chat also if um,
to detect shortcomings of the current physical theory? Uh, what would, uh, so what shortcomings would you like to detect? Okay, yeah. I think he has left. So are there any more questions? Yeah, if not, uh, let's thank Shailesh once again for the nice talk. Thanks. Thanks, sir.